Thank you, Kirsty, and thank you, Catherine, for really interesting presentation. My name is Lakshmi, and I am a tissue viability nurse consultant working in the community in England. And I am very lucky to have experience of both acute and, com and community. So I do share the passion that, you know, Catherine has just shown. And as she said, this is not just something happening in the acute, but happening in the community. So I do hope you have taken note on it because pressure also remain high on our agenda, irrespective of which part of the country or of the world you're working. So this watch party today is to remind you all of how important pressure ulcer prevention is because it is about reducing harm to our patient after all. So just to kind of tell you a little bit of what we covered today, and I'm sure you know COVID hasn't been really easy on anyone, be it in the acute or community. So I'll be sharing some of the challenges that we have faced in the community, but also we've had we have seen some benefits and that will follow with some case study on how we've kind of supported clinicians to manage pressure also despite any challenges. So this is about me and I'm here today, 14 years as a tissue viability, to share with you why it's still important for me as a nurse to educate other healthcare professionals, our workforce, informal carers or care, trained carers about pressure ulcer prevention. What were the challenges that we saw during COVID and why do we think they were challenges? First of all, I'm sure you will all agree with me, there was an rapid increase in end of life care that was sent in the community because patients were safer to be nursed at home due to the high risk of contracting other illness if admitted and obviously COVID was really one of the issues that we didn't want these patients to have but it's also about the preferred choice of the patient as we know in line with where you want to be in your end of life care we have to respect patient wishes but that's not only it we also have seen rapidly deteriorating patient they might have had multiple comorbidities but they also might be probably healthy but due to taking ill from one or the other they have rapidly deteriorated and these patients having taken to bed for a prolonged period they are at risk and mostly we, we also have noted is how many of you can vouch that we have seen patients refusing healthcare professional visits because they were scared of contracting COVID and I'm sure in the community many of you would agree with us that we knew we were taking the best um, protective, um, using our protective equipment to protect our patient, our staff and ourselves. but still as a human being, that fear was there. We also saw patients refusing their normal carers to attend them, to help them with their activities of daily living, personal care, toileting, uh, repositioning, just to minimize that contact with the outside work. But all, overall, we also see a, saw a decline in referrals being action, not just because there was not um, the medical professional didn't refer in a timely manner, but the people who actually needed the support did not contact the medical professional to refer to appropriate services in a timely manner. So these are overall have led to kind of patient not getting the right treatment and the right support in a timely manner. And these all led to the pressure also prevention challenge, because how do you prevent it if you're not able to access that pa uh, patient population? So, but overall, as I say, COVID also brought its benefit. As healthcare professional, when a patient say, we don't want you to come in because we're scared that you'll bring the infection to home. What we also said was that that's absolutely fine. Part of my job is also to empower you, empower your next of kin, your carers, your informal carers, so they can look after you with our support. And that's where we introduced self-care. And that self-care was introduced to a wider range of people. And as I mentioned, it could be your friends, it could be their relatives, it could be anyone who the, pa the patient would accept the direct support. But 
Oh, also, we noted there were some patients who understood their responsibility and they were very happy to have regular virtual reviews or sending us photographs of their wound regularly so that we can review, making sure the treatment was still working or if the treatment needed to be changed and we would you know, let them have the appropriate dressing, send them the care plan step by step of how to look after it but it was really taking accountability of their wounds. And this has been the key highlight of COVID for me because we knew patient who wished to retain their independence was able to do so. It was literally a sense of pride for the patient because they were able to redress their wounds and monitor their wounds themselves with the support of healthcare professional. But at the same time, when they saw the improvement, they knew it was, you know, because they were doing the right thing. So for me personally, it was a benefit that COVID brought to us because we've been able to use new technologies, a better self-care model, which previously we would not have done easily, but because the patient might not want to do it or the healthcare professional will be hesitant to upskill that informal carers or their relatives to do it thinking it's a complex one. We need to keep hold of it. So it's about, you know, trusting your patient as well. So now let's look at some case studies of how a patient who has taken suddenly ill due to uh, COVID and lost all her independence and how it was challenging to manage because of all the multiple comorbidities. This is my 82 year old ladies. She was prior to the fall, being able to mobilize and had capacity, lives alone, had minimal support from carers because she had a very supportive daughter who will help with the weekly shopping. And she wouldn't have carers because, you know, as everyone else, she believes she still could look after herself. But just one episode of fall have led to that lady being admitted with trauma. And as a result, you know, after two weeks of being in the acute, she was discharged home with a package of care for four times a day. And for somebody who had nothing previously to accept that package of care was really hard because for that patient, it's about losing their independence. It's that autonomy that I used to wash myself. Why do I suddenly need somebody to come and wash me four times a day or change me four times a day? So literally, it was kind of encouraging these patients that, you know, the support is not to take away that independence, but also to support you going back to that independence. But as you can see, my little lady here, she had capacity. She under understands her risk of, you know, not having the carers. And she, de she decided to reduce the care package from four times a day to literally once a day or twice a day only after much persuasion by the family. And on discharge, she developed what we call a deep tissue injury, which, as you could see, Catherine mentioned earlier, it was that damage on the skin, although the skin remains intact, but it was, we know it was deeper damage in the inside. So managing the community, which was absolutely fine, but because it was a new episode of care, because she was not known to the community nursing team prior to that fall, she was assessed. She had all the pressure of her prevention advice given. She declined to have an alternating air mattress. And she also declined if carers to reposition her or check her pressure areas every day because she believed that was, you know, inappropriate and they were intruding her personal space. She was somebody who was previously independent. So she would decide she would sit out during the day and only goes back to bed at 8 p.m. and being out on the chair for 12 hours when she now has got reduced mobility, needed support to transfer, that contributed to further damage. She did agree for an air cushion, but it had to be on her normal sofa. She would not have any other armchair or any chair that will support with further pressure relief. The daughter reflect, reported that she lost weight 
And but the patient declined a referral to the dietitian, which, as we know, if you're not optimizing your nutritional intake, it's quite difficult to maintain a healthy skin integrity. She didn't report any pain. She did agree with nurses to, you know, com com compromise with the pressure ulcer prevention as tolerated. She agreed also to use pad because she she had some incidences where she could not get to toilet on time. And this is to show you how quickly somebody who has been independent prior to that fall suddenly taken ill and everything start changing and how, why the patient feel that, you know, we are taking that autonomy from them. And obviously from a nursing input, what we do in the community for pressure ulcer management, if somebody is making an unwise decision, declining care or refusing to engage, we usually complete what we call a mental capacity assessment. This is not just to check the patient's capacity, but also to make sure the patient understood all the risk that she may that may contribute to her health. And in case she's not understanding the verbal, we also make sure she was able to retain, process that information and able to communicate her wish after acknowledging the risk. In my area, we also do what we call a care contract. That care contract, really what it does, it states out all the information that you've told the patient verbally, but in writing, because some patient might not be able to retain the verbal information but after reading it, they were able to process and understand that better. So that care contract will really use, it, it, it's framed based on the Eskin model. And what it does, it tells the patient about why it's important to be repositioned, about your um, skin checks regularly, repositioning, managing your incontinence properly, using the appropriate pad and barrier cream, and also ensuring your nutritional and hydration intake was correct. We also involved the daughter in decision making because patient had capacity and was making an unwise decision. This was just to ensure the patient was well supported and that the next of kin could support the mum in better decision making because obviously explaining of the risk because having a deep tissue damage on a sacral area, sitting for 10 hours a day, we know what was going to happen. And obviously, despite all the nursing input and everything, we had an SOS call, what we call like the daughter contacted the nursing to say something was bleeding from the mom's sacrum and she was suddenly in agony. The patient at that time stated she hasn't been to bed for three days and she's been sitting on that sofa for three days, slept on it. The only time she mobilized was when she was helped to the toilet or had her pad changed. At that time, if you remember the classification of pressure ulcer, that sacrum has gone from deep tissue damage to 100% necrosis, which was what we call unstageable. That means you could not see the base or the accurate depth of that damage. So that patient was referred to us as, you know, the process for community and initial assessment we reviewed. We started on autolytic debridement. That means gentle process of removing that necrosis while not like causing more pain to the patient because at that time her pain was already 10 over 10. So we were not going to use sharp debridement or other form of debridement to cause her more pain. We did a mental capacity assessment again. We did know that she still was making the unwise decision despite showing her the extent of the damage of her sacral area. We also escalated to our safeguarding because remember, it's a holistic approach to managing the patient. It's not just the nurse's responsibility. We've got to make sure we're managing the patient from a multidisciplinary point of view. And all that the next of kin who also had power of attorney for health was fully involved in that decision making because she was very upset that the mom developed that. But because the mom had capacity, she would not listen to the daughter as well. We got social services involved again to review the package of care because as you remember initially she reduced that package of care 
uh, her general practitioner, her GP was fully on board and supported all the approaches that we did, had a conversation with the patient where she finally agreed to have the dietitian referral because she considered that, yes, I am losing weight and I really need more help now because the pain is too much. The GP would reassess her pain management. We also referred her to palliative care for symptom control. One thing we have to remember in the community, very often when you say we'll refer to palliative, people will think, oh my God, it's end of life. It's not just for end of life. Palliative are also very, very supportive to manage symptom control. And they're the best person to approach that because there are different ways of pain management. So that's the reason why we also got not just our therapists and our GP involved, we also got our palliative care team involved. And as you can see, this was the wound when we assessed the patient. And as I mentioned earlier, we used a skin bundle, which is a national recognized care bundle where you know the five holistic approach for managing pressure ulcers are completed and needs to be done in line with national guidance. So assessment, A for assessment, as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, everything was done in line involving the next of kin and the patient, so there's better understanding and improve the concordance. We also look at equipment and we also advise the patient of why it's important to use pressure relieving equipment properly and why this will help minimizing pain and reducing further damage in the future. Most of all, we also had to in educate the carers in assessing the skin. But remember, the carers does not just have to be the paid ca um, in carers. It can also be the family members or any informal carers that's promoting or providing support to the patient. It can be the next of kin, it can be a friend. So whoever is supporting the patient should have that education on regular skin check. And also K, as if you think of repositioning, that patient was sitting for 10 hours a day. So really it's about encouraging the patient why it's important to offload the pressure areas. Us as healthy people, if we are sitting out and I sit for your next 20 minutes, none of you move, literally we'll all start to be fidgeting because we can feel the damage, we can feel the pressure. But what about our patient who can feel it but can't move by themselves or those who can't feel it at all? This is where your assessment needs to come in. Who needs to be repositioned at what frequency? And that's why it's really important to assess that properly on an individual level. Don't forget your incontinence because we need to ensure patients are using appropriate absorbent pad and not using overlying, overlining of pads, pads over pads, or using inappropriate body cream where the skin is already vulnerable there and you're just going to make it worse. And for the nutrition and hydration, very important to make sure that it's really supporting and maintaining the skin integrity. G for giving information, as you could see, we've done the mental capacity assessment, we've done the care contract, we've provided all information both verbally and in writing to make sure that there's good understanding of care, the rationale for the care you're, you, you're promoting for that patient and why it's really important for that patient to have that pressure ulcer prevention because she had a multiple comorbidities which increase her risk factors of developing that pressure ulcer. We love pictures as you know that and the attached pictures here is after sharp debridement to remove the necrosis after using two weeks of dressing to soften that necrosis. And as I say, post debridement, you could see the bone was visible. It was really high exuding. There was a mixture of both healthy and unhealthy. And the aim was to help with exudate management, but also to reduce the bio burden in the wound bed. And for that, we started on an antimicrobial enzyme alginogel. We ensure all the S skin bundle remain in place. And we pro uh, requested for the nurses to change the dressing three times a week because of the, of the exudate level. 
at that point, the patient agreed to be repositioned during the day as well. We didn't take the sitting out completely. We agreed that she could sit out between two carers call because we've increased the care package to four times a day now. So she was set out in the morning and sit, go back to bed after lunchtime, which worked really well for her because she gets to see her TV. She gets to sit out for her breakfast and her lunch and she's understood why. And because of the pain, she understood why it was really important to offload that sacral area. And as you can see, as I say, we love pictures. You can see two weeks post the treatment when we started uh, the enzyme alginogel, you can see there was more healthy tissue than unhealthy in the wound bed. And as the wound carries on improving, we were able to actually reduce the dressing as well. So there was further granulation noted. The pain was now well managed. Most of all, eating and drinking was better. The patient was having a supplement protein, which was prescribed by the dietitian. She who was better concording with the treatment because she didn't want to go back to that pain. And she was happier in herself. It improves her quality of life. And the daughter was very happy because she saw the improvement. Every time the district nurses will go in to do the dressing, she would be there taking photograph and showing into her mom. And when both next of kin and patient are looking at the improvement, it really empowered them to say, it's working, let's carry on. And as I say, at that time, um, because the wound was improving, the daughter stepped in, but, you know, everybody has got some issues and not everybody can maintain four times a day care package. So she stepped down to two times daily care package because of the financial situation. But the family was much more involved. The patient wasn't sitting out for long as her mobility improved with therapy input, which would mean she was able to stand up with a Zimmer frame and that could be supported by the daughter to transfer her from the chair to the bed after, you know, within the two calls. So she was having her call AM and PM for skin care and repositioning and personal care. But in between the day, the patient mobility had improved because of our therapy input as well. So how do we overcome the challenges in the community? As you can see from that case scenarios, it was not just carers, family members, or tissue viability. It was a lot of healthcare professional involved. So in my area of practice, as I always say, we don't just look at the hole in the patient, but we approach the patient holistically. I know mental capacity is some, sometimes overlooked, please do remember, it's really key to patient's care. We cannot force treatment on somebody, but we can check whether they understand the rationale for the treatment. And if they are making unwise decision, are we as healthcare professional giving the right information to them? Also, this helped to improve concordance because by giving information in writing, we are enabling both patient carers and relative to retain the information and understand better why you want to do what. Equipment, remember, not everybody wants to have a, a profiling bed or hospital bed, as we call it, or an air mattress. Some people may have some emotional attachment to their previous bed or furniture. This need to be respected. Your rational needs to be given, but you also need to document properly your assessment and if the equipment that they wish to keep to maintain, like this lady wanted to keep her sofa, there was no problem with us. But she also agreed to have the air cushion on top of her sofa, Whether rather than me saying, well, no, I'm just going to give you a recliner that's got an inbuilt pressure relief device on it and you've got to use it. So we did respect her wishes and that's why it built up that relationship as well. So remember, and also very often you will see patients don't want an air mattress. Some people will tell you, I feel seasick on it and I feel like I'm floating all day. It's absolutely fine to feel like that. Have a go yourself on it. If you can't stay on it for 24 seven and one of your patients said to you, this is how I feel. Unless you've tried it, you won't be able to understand it. But it's also about explaining the benefit and reviewing after the treatment is, is completed. 
can we step down the patient to a normal mattress, which they are more comfortable as they're concording more with the treatment? Because this is what engagement is all about. It's about working with them, not working for them. And uh, this is really some about my, uh, my experiences from a community tissue viability point of view. But as I said, what um, Kirsty and um, Catherine has mentioned, pressure also remain very high on all of our agenda. And I'm just hoping this watch party will generate quite a lot of thoughts among yourself where you'll be able to share what we've been able to share with you to other disciplines of the healthcare professional so that you are able to make pressure ulcer your business. Remember, we are heading towards Stop the Pressure Ulcer Week, where it's in the worldwide celebration to make sure that people know that pressure ulcer is everybody's business. Thank you.